No, we're going to be done with our notes. American government. We talked about last night. What? Okay, uh, we can't. Hey, uh, how many guys? How many guys had a chance to watch State of the Union last night? I watched five minutes. Five minutes. The uh, third longest State of the Union address in American history. Uh, Democrats stood for lowering prescription drug prices and like vote tech when he talked about vote tech, uh, education. Um, I don't know if there's much else they stood for except for some of the people that. President Trump recognized in the balcony. Now, if you didn't see the part about the guy from North Korea, oh, I saw that. Okay, you got to see that. Okay, because this guy has an amazing story, and uh, the fact that he brought the crunch crutches with him and just thrust them into the air, I thought was pretty dang cool. Was he running a shot? Uh, he was run over by a train uh, trying to steal coal to trade for food in North Korea and had to have his right, or one of his legs amputated and one of his hands am amputated. Then his dad built him some homemade crutches and he escaped to China on crutches uh, and nearly drowned. Um, was tortured, uh, trying to cross back in with food for his family and then finally escaped. Now he lives in South Korea in Seoul and he helps other people that escape from North Korea. Uh, it's Pretty amazing story. Uh, so, you didn't get, if you didn't you know, see any of it, that's probably the highlight. Uh, but it was, a, it was a positive speech. It was patriotic um, and optimistic. Uh, he was, the president was very uh, calm. You know, it wasn't like one of his rally speeches. Um, CBS did a snap poll of people that watched it. And 75% of people watched it thought it was a good speech. 43% of Democrats thought it was a good speech. 72% of independents thought it was a good speech. And something like 90-something percent of Republicans thought it was a good speech. Yeah? On, on certain things they disagree with, they don't, they don't stand. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, that's that's common. For those of you that haven't watched the State of the Union address before. Why do they have to stand every two seconds? Yeah, it's part, like it's just, the there are, what, a hundred and some applause interruptions. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think they said like 120. Yeah, so, I mean, that is very common. That's our State of the Union address. Uh, happens once a year, and uh, it's, const it's in the Constitution. The President does have to give this address. Um, and so take it for what you will. Um, on the issue of uh, immigration, which is kind of like the big issue right now, um, you know, it, it looks as if President Trump has, you know, gone further than what President Obama said he wanted to do, uh, as far as with, the, with DREAMers or DACA recipients and so forth. Um, it'll be interesting to see if they can compromise, and I, I don't know. There's so much vitriol, um, and if you watch CNN and MSNBC, it, it's just basically outright hatred of President Trump. Um, Mr. I was talking to Mr. Lemonian this morning about it, and he's like, so, you know, I can go to Fox News, and I kind of know what I'm going to get. I can go to CNN, I know what I'm going to get. Is there anywhere I can, like, get unbiased news? And the answer is no, there isn't. Um, which stinks, uh, but everybody puts their opinion in it. What do you got? It is. Someone claims to be unbiased probably means they're especially biased. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to find it. Um, so I, that's why I would say, hey, watch the speech for yourself, and then you can decide what you think about it. I mean, but listening to the pundits. You're not going to get a you're not going to get a fair view either way. Okay, so yesterday 
we uh, talked about the French and Indian War, okay, which um, which ends in 1763. So 1756 to 1763 is the Seven Years' War, okay. It is after this the British are going to keep those troops, many of those 20,000 regulars, in country. They're going to leave them in the colonies and then ask that the colonists help pay for the British debt that is incurred not just from this war but the four wars of empire and to help you know, pay for the troops that are stationed in country uh, to protect them from... Uh, you know, from the outsiders, okay? Whether it be the natives or the French again or what have you, okay? So, um, basically here, in 1765, the British are going to impose, Parliament is going to impose the Stamp Act. And everybody remembers the Stamp Act. A lot of this history is rehash what you learned in 8th grade and again in hopefully 11th grade, uh, but we're going to hit it one more time. Okay. The Stamp Act is going to place a uh, tax on all printed materials. Okay. Now, do the colonies have any representatives in Parliament? Do, does New York have a representative in Parliament? So the answer to that question is no. We don't have any representatives there. So this is uh, what? Taxation. Virtual representation. Okay, now, um, this quote, taxation without representation, is taken from a document written during the Stamp Act Congress. And it was a document written by who? It was called the Declaration of? <laughs> rights and? Responsibilities. Say it. Rights and grievances. Grievances, OK. doing that. Okay, who wrote that? Me. Somebody. John Adams. <laughs> He's going to write the Declaration of Rights and Grievances. And the grievance is, is that there is no representation for the colonies. What document that we just studied does this violate? The English Bill of Rights and the Petition of Right, actually. It violates both of those. Not the Magna Carta? I don't think so. Okay, so what they're saying is that their rights are being trampled upon, and the letter itself is announcing their grievances to the British, to the King, and to the Parliament. Okay? And guys, guess what? They're going to repeal it. <coughs> they're going to repeal the Stamp Act. But this doesn't change the fact that Britain's in debt, does it? So they're going to impose some new taxes on things like tea and sugar. Okay? And they're going to place restrictions on where we can get that tea and sugar because they want us to pay tax on it. They want us to buy all our tea from Britain. So we have to drink their foul brew. Okay. You don't have a choice, though. Here's the thing. You don't have a choice. You don't have the freedom. You don't have the economic freedom. Okay. And so there's a group of men that get together that are going to start writing letters. And it's going to become known as the Committee of Correspondence. There's two R's. Yes.
Is that an E or an A? Correspondence. E? That's right. That's right. <laughs> Let me give you some names of people that were members of the committees of correspondence. There was a guy named uh, Sam Adams. Yep. Uh, another one named John Hancock. No way. Of course, John Adams was part of this as well. Yeah, they're cousins. Uh, let's see. Um, there's a guy named Thomas Paine. That's part of this committee's correspondence. Another one named Ben Franklin. And, and you've probably heard of this name, Alexander Hamilton. No, he's the guy from the Virgin Islands. The bastard child from the Virgin Islands. So these guys are going to start writing letters to the Parliament, to the King, objecting to all of these things. Okay? So they don't do away with the Sugar and Tea Act. And by 1970, we have an incident on the streets of Boston. It is the Boston oh, Massacre. Oh, 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 mass put massacre. massacre in quotes. Yeah. Like finger quotes. Yeah. Like, you don't want to. Yeah. 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 Dude, I totally would have got a boy right back in the day. Oh, I know you would have. You would have so redistributed the crap out of your land after the war. Who would have kicked you out? Now. The British were, as I told you guys, in in Boston. They, they had troops posted. And um, people would make fun of them. People would harass them, call them lobster backs and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Because of their red coats. Yeah. Um, the, um, that fateful night, um, there was a mob of people, and they were throwing snowballs. At the uh, <laughs> British soldiers. With ice in them? Yeah, there was some ice involved. And guys, I don't know if you guys know this. Like, if you live near the coast, sometimes they'll use like seashells as broken up as like roads. You know what I mean? Just crushed rock, like crushed rock. Um, so they were throwing things like oyster shells at the soldiers as well. And uh, one of the soldiers um, discharged his weapon and. Then other soldiers discharged their weapon, and five people were killed. Okay, there were many other shot. Okay, that didn't die. Now there was a famous uh, trivia question on this. One of the five that was killed was a black man. Go. His name is Crispus Attucks. Crispus Attucks, or some say Atticus. Attucks. Okay. He was a free, free black man. Yes, he was. Okay, now, um, these soldiers are going to put on be put on trial, but they need an attorney. They need representation, and that would be John Adams. Now, John Adams is going to represent these soldiers, and he's going to do a really good job at that. Now, think about this. The British are hated in Boston, so John Adams, who has a law practice in Boston and then a farm outside of Boston, is really risking his business, his law practice, by representing somebody that is so hated. It's kind of like somebody representing, you know, the Carr brothers or BTK. People are like, how can you represent people like that? Somebody has to. Somebody has to. You're right. And, and John Adams believes in the law, okay? And so he presents a very good defense for these soldiers. Now. Everybody was pretty angry at the British at this point, and Paul Revere decided to paint a, de a depiction of the Boston Massacre. On a baseball? On a baseball. Okay. It's one that you've seen in every school textbook since you were three years old. Okay. Uh, I had a student of mine. You can pass that around. Um, 
brought that back from Boston for me, okay? And I've had some other students do that too. So like I got it. the USS Constitution, which is a ship. Is there a large market Washington, for DC. baseballs and historic American? Another in Washington, yes. D.C. Yes, there are. And one from Gettysburg. Well, he has like six. You should that, play ball like with the real. But nobody seen this year to bring anything back from Washington for me, I guess. You did. Uh, you did. Show us your collection. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you did. Thank you, Austin. I'm in the picture. You're in the picture. Yeah, the family and father. Okay. Um, so, guys, this image that you're seeing is spread throughout the colonies. It's propaganda is what it is. Paul Revere... It's created a piece of propaganda to call this a massacre, okay? Adams is going to get these guys off for murder charges. They're not going to be convicted of murder, okay? They, there are some minor crimes that they are convicted of, but uh, nothing that's going to, you know, see them hung in the streets of Boston, Boston okay? Boston. All right, so um, that happens. And then in um, 1773, this Committees of Correspondence is starting to become a little more radical. So we're going to change the name. We're going to call them what? Sons of Freedom. Sons of Liberty. Oh, whoops. Oh. Same, same thing. But Correct. And in 1773... Hanging out in the tavern one night, if you use your imagination a little bit, these guys were probably drinking. And somebody came up with the idea, hey, let's start a beer brand. Let's dress up as Indians, Mohawk Indians, and let's storm the ship and throw all the caskets of tea into the harbor. So in 1773, you get the Boston Tea Party. Hundreds of chests of tea. Now, the British are not going to take kindly to this. And so they, in 1774, the British are going to pass what they call the Coercive Acts. But we call them what? Intolerable. Okay. The Intolerable Acts. Now, guys, these are going to do several things. First off, they're going to allow the quartering of British soldiers in people's homes. That violates which of the documents we study? They're going to allow the search and seizure of people's homes, which violates they're also going to say that if any British subject or somebody that represents the crown is charged with a capital crime in, a, in the New World, they will be sent back to England for trial. What? So basically, if the Boston Massacre had occurred in 1774... The British soldiers would have been sent back to England for trial. This is where John Adams, who refused to join the Sons of Liberty, is now had enough. And John Adams is going to join the Sons of Liberty. Okay? This is a respected attorney. Now, okay, Hancock was a smuggler. Hancock was a very wealthy smuggler that really didn't like the British stifling his commerce. Sam Adams was just a, you know, a rabble rouser. He was a troublemaker who believed in freedom. You know, I mean, obviously this guy's a patriot, Sam Adams. He wore the same suit every day. The red suit. And, and this red coat. Yeah, I mean, he was kind of a shadowy figure, Sam Adams. Shadowy? Kind of a Where, Churchill type of guy. <laughs> Hancock, on the other hand, is this very wealthy, 
kind of aristocratic guy. They're a weird couple, but they become close friends because they share this hatred of Britain. Okay? All right. So, when John Adams joins the Sons of Liberty, it's about this time. Oh, guys, by the way, they shut down Boston Harbor. No commerce. No commerce. No commerce. They shut it down. Okay? They start unloading cannons in the city of Boston. Basically, the Royal Navy has set up shop in Boston Harbor, bring more troops in. And so, basically, you have a police state in Boston. So what does Hancock and Adams start to do? They start to stockpile weapons and powder outside of Boston. Uh -oh. You know, out there in a place called Lexington and Concord. Whoa. Okay. In 1774, in response to the Intolerable Act, Leaders from among the different colonies agree to meet in what becomes known as the First Continental Congress. In what city? Philadelphia. Right. At a place called Carpenter's Hall that will later become known as Independence Hall. Have any of you guys been to Independence Hall in Philly? I went as a kid. All right. Not much really happens here, okay? But they agree to boycott some British goods, kind of see if the British will retract some of these intolerable acts, and agree to meet again if necessary. Well, on April 19, 1774. After Thomas Paine's little pamphlet? Huh? This is April 15, 19, 1775. Excuse me. <coughs> General Howe, April 19th, General Howe is going to lead troops, and they're looking for two men to arrest, Hancock and Sam Adams, and they're also wanting to seize the guns and powder that they have been stockpiling in Lexington and Concord. On their way out, General Howe will be met by the Minutemen. All right, Paul, how are you doing? Uh, well, I'm talking about the Lexington Lexington and Concord. 
they're met, the British are, on the road out there by the Minutemen, the militia, okay? You guys, really, literally, this militia is local citizens, okay? From 15-year-old boys, okay, doctors, lawyers, shopkeepers, farmers, okay? And they're going to stop the British from reaching Lexington and Concord, okay? And uh, this is the start of the revolution, 1775, April 19th, okay? Now, with that, they said, if we need to, we'll meet again. All right? So, in 1775, they're going to have the Second Continental Congress. And each of the 13 colonies will send delegates. Massachusetts is going to send John Adams. Sam Adams, Thomas Paine, and a guy named Elbridge Gary, or Elbridge Jerry. Pennsylvania is going to send Ben Franklin. Virginia is going to send Thomas Jefferson. George Washington and Richard Henry Lee. New York will send Sherman. Okay. Roger Sherman. Okay. No. Yeah, Roger Sherman. Okay. Now, this body is going to meet from 1775 to 1781. Now, John Adams, guys, as you're going to see from the videos we watch, is really going to become the driving force for independence. Now, in 1775, nobody was really saying the word independence out loud in public. Okay? This idea is going to brew. Because shortly after Lexington and Concord, we're going to have the Battle of Bunker Hill, where the British will attack. It's actually Breed's Hill, Bunker Hill, or Breed's Hill. And a, a, a lot of Massachusetts, Massachusetts, what do you call those people? Massachusetts. Massachusetts? No, no, I don't know. Massachusetts. 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 A lot of people are going to die. Okay? And they're going to take a lot of British with them when they die, okay? including a lot of British officers. This is where, where William Prescott says, don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes. They started running low on ammunition, so they were sticking stuff down the barrel like rocks and pieces of glass. Coal? Eventually, the militia was overrun, okay? In fact, as you'll see in the video, guys, um, John Adams' family doctor, Warren, his last name is Warren, is killed by the British, okay? Adams is going to talk about this in front of the convention. Why am I saying convention? This is Congress. Why are you guys not fixing me on this? This is the Continental Congress. Okay, Second Continental Congress. All right, now, um, when they declare independence, July 6th, 1770, July 4th, 1776. Yeah, I know. I'm writing and talking at the same time, okay? So deal with it. These men are committing treason. Now, one of the documents, and somebody brought this up and I'll be talking about it in a minute, is Common Sense written by Thomas Paine that is going to convince people we need to help convince people we need to do this. But is Common Sense Common Sense? All right, Tristan, 
You're starting to piss me off. Go back to Iceland. Okay, Go now. To so, uh, who writes this? Jefferson writes the Declaration. As I told you before, I think five men were on the committee. Okay. Um, Jefferson's going to write this. And when they sign it, guys, they are committing treason. And so basically the government of this country, when they declare independence, the only thing of holding the 13 colonies together, which now essentially have become 13 countries, the only thing tying these countries together is the Continental Congress, which will be in session from 1775 to 1781. The war lasts till 1783. In 1781, they'll write the first constitution, the Articles of Confederation. Yeah? Is there the governor of the states on board with independence when they declare independence? Okay, that's a good question, okay? So when the delegates showed up for the Second Continental Congress, the decision wasn't made. So back in each colony, what they're doing is they're having conventions, like the Virginia Convention basically was put together to, to announce whether they were going to support independence or not. And then they gave directions to the delegates in Philadelphia. And this is where Patrick Henry famously gives his speech at the Virginia Convention saying, give me liberty or give me death. And he's talking about telling Richard Henry Lee, Thomas Jefferson, and George Washington, yes, vote for independence. So if a state voted, did any of the states vote against independence? Say that again? Did any of the states vote against independence? Oh yeah, there were many states that didn't want it, especially South Carolina, North Carolina. Uh, Pennsylvania was divided. You had Ben Franklin that supported independence, but his compatriot, uh, his name, you're going to see him in the video, uh, his name's escaping me right now. He's a, he's, a, he's a Quaker, and he's opposed to, he wants to reconcile with Britain, okay? New York was opposed to it, and you got to have New York, okay? So John Adams becomes the guy that's trying to convince everybody we need to do this. Go ahead, Jack, sorry. Uh, so the Articles of the Federation written in 1783? Yep. No, 1781. I'm sorry. 1781. Yeah. So, the, yeah. Uh, the war lasted 83. Thank you, Jack. Trust me. Um, did most people not want independence, but just want um, their four common states? Did most people just want, like, representation? Yeah, I mean, they wanted the problems resolved. They wanted their rights back. They wanted Britain to not treat them like stepchildren. You know what I mean? Well, um, like if they were to get refugees, like I'm just kind of confused. I'm not trying to like argue, but uh, if they were to be given representation when they're just so minor, like a minority in Parliament, which they yeah, included, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, if they gave, say, they gave every colony one representative in the Parliament, we might still be British. I don't know. You know what I mean? If, if they would have given us representation to make these decisions to tax ourselves. But somebody else taxing us without a say was unacceptable to them and to us today, I would say. Yeah. So when they voted independence, the people that didn't want it just got roped in? In fact, the guy from Pennsylvania was asked to leave the room. Anybody that wasn't willing to put their name on the paper was asked to leave. But the states were all just like, yeah, I mean, once they once they convinced everybody to vote yes, um, they did. Which they they said, all right, here we are. And what Franklin said is, we must assuredly all hang together, or we will most assuredly hang separately. The whole snake thing, right? Yeah, the snake cartoon. Don't tread on me. Not that one. Divided, live or die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, which was the last? Um, colony to ratify the decision? Well, they all did it together. Okay. So who was the last one to decide yes? Yeah. 
I would say Pennsylvania. Okay, maybe I'm thinking of the Constitution. But I know there was one. That well, yeah, Virginia and New York were split, Virginia deeply divided on the Constitution. Yeah. And that's why the Federalist Papers were written and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, guys, this is um, this convention is basically our government. And, and so the Second Continental Congress is actually going to have to flee Philadelphia. Now, as I was saying, you got 13 separate countries. Each one of those countries, Virginia and South Carolina and New York, and so they're all going to write, write their own constitutions. Okay? So, like, when we talked about Charles Carroll from Maryland, he stayed in Maryland, didn't go to the Constitutional Convention because he was working on issues in his own state. Okay? Jefferson was working on the Constitution of Virginia. He wanted to work on that. Now, he went over to France as the ambassador to France. But uh, So it's really interesting to study these what we call state constitutions, but they're actually countries, okay? Um, because some of these state constitutions put things in there like official state religions. Like you cannot serve in public office unless you are this religion. Some of them put in their Bill of Rights in the state constitutions, which was important to protect people's freedom and their rights, okay? Uh, so the state constitutions are a great study in and of themselves. Um, but this basically ends what we're talking about with the Declaration of Independence, okay? Now, in your book, if you go to page 20, Four, three, 22, 20, 1. Page 21 in your book. We're going to watch this video that there's a summary of on Monday. Okay? Tomorrow and Friday, we're going to watch parts of episode and one of two of this. Okay? Which is just fantastic. I mean, it is fantastic, okay? Um, so we're going to watch that, and then we'll show, like, the, the trial of the British soldiers, the Boston Massacre, um, uh, the uh, battles of Lexington and Concord. You get to see tar and feathering, like, actually carried out in this, which is, like, graphic, okay? Um, so I'll give, a, I'll give a parental warning on that. Okay. Um, so we'll watch two days of that. Now, uh, page 22. The last paragraph of your essay is talking about the founding fathers and famous documents and speeches. So if you look at page 22, uh, there's a little write-up on Hancock and Adams. And then page 23, Paul Revere. 25, Patrick Henry's speech before the Virginia Convention, give me liberty or give me death. Page 27, common sense. Okay, and this pamphlet, guys, is going to sell hundreds of thousands of copies in the new world. Okay, I have it laying around here somewhere. Oh, it's on my podium. It's not a very large document, okay? common sense, okay? But it lays out in black and white a really good argument of why Britain shouldn't rule over the New World, okay? And this is really one of the driving forces for independence, this book right here, okay? So you would definitely want to mention common sense and the, its author in your essay. And then on page 29, you wouldn't necessarily have to include this in your essay, but Thomas Paine, yeah, it's a good one. Thomas Paine wrote The Crisis. Now, if you look at the date, it's December 1776. Now, at the beginning of the Revolution, Washington is named Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. Now, where do they come up with that name, Continental Army? I mean, they're just making this stuff up. They, you know, these are new terms. This is something that's never been done before. Okay, so everything is new. So they called the Continental Army, and they're going to call him, the, you know, the general of the Continental Army, George Washington. 
and he's going to be able to raise an army of about 20,000. And they go up to New York. Okay? General Knox brings the cannon from Ticonderoga, drags them across the Berkshire Mountains, floats them across uh, the, the lake, and then they rim the city of Boston with these cannon overnight. The British wake up who have occupied Boston and see all these cannon. Okay? As one guy put it, it sent the British scurrying like rats. Okay, they left. So the British packed up all their ships, left Boston. They could have torched it. They could have knocked it down, but they didn't. And all those ships went up the coast to New York and preparing for the British to take over New York. So Washington sends 20,000 men. He goes up there with them to New York. And they're about to get their butts whooped. And Washington really begins his str strategy of the war, which is only fight the British where you have a chance to win and never give up the army. So he didn't really have a chance to win at Brooklyn Heights and in New York City, and so he fled. And he fled south to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. The British are fair-weather fair fighters. They don't want to fight in the winter. So they stay up in New York. They send the Hessians down, these hired mercenaries, down into New Jersey to stop the, uh, you know, the Americans from coming north in the winter. And so things get quiet. But Washington's army, most of his soldiers have like six-month enlistments. So those guys are like leaving. And his army goes from 20,000 to around 1,000. And they're down in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, freezing their butts off. Okay? And Thomas Paine pens this letter. And Washington reads it to the troops. They're also going to bring in that guy, uh, Baron von Steuben. Sh what? Steuben. Steuben? Yeah. I've always called him Steuben. But anyhow, this Prussian drill sergeant to help train these American troops, okay? So let's just take a second for the heck of it and read this excerpt from the American Crisis. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he who stands now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we attain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. Tis dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to set a proper price on its goods. And it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly attained. Do you understand what he's saying? This is not going to be easy. Those of you that do not shrink from this challenge, the reward will be great. The reward is freedom. Okay. So Washington, on Christmas Eve, just five days later, is going to devise a plan in a blowing sleet storm in the dead of winter, under the cover of darkness. His troops are going to march to the Delaware River, where they're going to take rafts across the Delaware River, where large chunks of ice are flowing down the river in this sleet storm and they're going to attack the city of Trent at dawn just trying to get there before dawn but they get there about dawn and they are going to defeat the Hessians in Trent, New Jersey okay? and this will be one of the only one of the few victories that the Americans will have during the revolution okay? a few days later they will have a victory at Princeton and then the following year, in 1777, 
later in that summer at Saratoga, New York, which is going to bring the French and the Spanish in on our side. Yes? So, uh, where's Admiral Howe in all of this? What's he doing? He's on the ship somewhere. Yeah? Okay, now his brother, General Howe, yeah, is yeah, fighting. General Howe, yeah. What's Admiral Howe doing? What's He's on the ship. What's his nickname? Richard. <laughs> I'm not doing it, Jack. I'm not falling for it. All right, so tomorrow, John Adams. Friday, John Adams. Monday, important video to watch and pay it, possibly take some notes. Help you with your essay. It'll review a lot of the stuff we did today. All right, thanks.